two eruptions, two quakes, one solar storm, all inside three days. That shouldn't line up, and yet it did. Two stars bright enough to catch with the naked eye. Back to back, magnitude six quakes in Venezuela, and a coronal mass ejection plowing through the path of a rare comet from beyond our sun's neighborhood. If that sounds like a loaded week, you're not wrong. The question is simple, coincidence or a clue we've been missing? Before we go further, here's what actually hit 3i Atlas. It wasn't just solar wind, it was a full coronal mass ejection, a rolling front of magnetized plasma launched by the sun. Think of three parts, a shockwave out front that compresses everything in its way, a turbulent sheath of supercharged particles right behind it, and a twisted magnetic bubble called a flux rope at the core. Near the sun, the blast can race out at hundreds to well over a thousand kilometers per second, carrying billions of tons of ionized gas locked to magnetic fields. Models like WSA ENLIL flagged its trajectory sweeping across the helio longitude where 3I Atlas was threading into the inner system. That matters because a comet's long blue ion tail is basically a windsock for the interplanetary magnetic field. When a CME's shock slams in, the field lines around the comet can flip or reconnect. The coma compresses, the ion tail kinks, and sometimes the tail literally snaps off in a disconnection event, drifting away while a fresh tail regrows. We've watched that happen to comets like Enki and Lovejoy. Seeing it on an interstellar visitor is next level. If Mars orbiters or heliophysics missions caught a spike in solar wind speed and magnetic field rotation near the same time, that's the smoking gun. The short version. What hit 3i Atlas was a magnetic battering ram the kind that can tear at a comet's tail and redraw its shape in hours. Let's get back to the math everyone's arguing about. Naked eye novae are rare, some years none, some years one. Two in approximately 48 hours, twin M6 quakes and a timed CME on top of it. The overlap feels impossible, but rare events clump. It's called Poisson clustering. Randomness doesn't spread out politely, it bunches. So the week looks loaded, without proving anything mysterious is pulling the strings. The first spark came from a white dwarf in Centaurus that flashed into view after a runaway fusion burst. Surveys flagged it fast. High energy detectors caught shock signatures. The details of peak brightness and timing got debated, but the headline was simple, a hard punch, not a gentle swell. Then the ground moved. A shallow magnitude six quake near Mene Grande and hours later, another of similar size. Classic stress transfer on a loaded fault, followed by aftershocks. On social feeds, theories popped up about the sun triggering quakes. Seismologists pushed back. There's no robust evidence that solar storms flip faults. Tectonics explain the sequence. While crews in Venezuela worked through the night, the sky delivered a second surprise in Sagittarius. Another nova, another rush to timestamp detections, Another round of checks on shock speeds and dust formation. Teams verified before posting, which fueled speculation, but that's standard practice when signals are this bright. All the while, the sun was in a mood. Solar maximum makes eruptions common, but common doesn't mean boring. The CME in question blasted off and rolled through the inner solar system at just the wrong, or right, time. The path lined up with a comet many were calling 3I Atlas. Fast, retrograde, and likely not native to our system. The three I tag matters because the International Astronomical Union is careful about confirming interstellar status. People toss the label around anyway. That's how you end up with late night debates about whether we just watched the first clean CME comet interaction on a visitor from another star. If so, it's a dream for plasma physics. CME fronts can rip the magnetic drape around a comet and literally sever its tail. We've seen that before with homegrown comets like Enki. Seeing it happen to an interstellar passerby? That's a once-in-a-generation lab in space. Mars orbiters eyed the geometry, hoping for a side-on look. If a tail kink or a full disconnection event showed up, it would be a headline on its own. And if the comet shed fragments under the stress, even bigger. But that wasn't the whole story. Because the real tug-of-war wasn't just in the sky or under the ground. It was in our heads. Stack enough rare events and we connect dots by instinct. Defect, misleading. Random processes stutter and clump. 
so quiet weeks can be followed by fireworks. Real links demand predictions made ahead of time and mechanisms that repeat across cycles. Until then, the clean answer is coincidence, plus our human need to make it make sense. Still, uncomfortable can be productive. This stack turned the sky into a classroom. If you want in on the next chapter, circle a few windows. Late October has been hyped for a swan comet's pass, with dark skies helping its faint tail pop before dawn. The rumored interstellar candidate pushes toward its closest approach to the sun by month's end, where activity can spike, sometimes dramatically. If the tail snaps or a dust outburst hits, it puts on a different face almost overnight, and December brings a more comfortable observing geometry for that same object if it holds together, giving amateurs a shot at useful time series data. If you go hunting, do it smart. Give your eyes half an hour in the dark. Use a red light. Keep optics well away from the sun unless you're using certified front-mounted solar filters. And if you catch something weird, a sudden brightening, a kink in the tail, a suspected disconnection, write down the time, location, and gear. Compare notes, then submit to places like AAVSO, the International Comet Quarterly, or COBS. Responsible reports beat viral guesses every time. Since everyone keeps asking whether that CME could do anything to the comet's core, here's the quick reality check. The nucleus is a lump of ice rock tens to hundreds of meters across, sometimes more, with almost no gravity. A CME won't crack it like a hammer. What it can do is strip ions, heat and compress the coma, and trigger magnetic reconnection that sweeps the tail clean. Observers look for three telltales. A sudden drop and rebound in the ion tail's brightness, a visible gap marching down the tail away from the nucleus, and a rotation in the tail's position angle as the interplanetary magnetic field flips. On top of that, one more trick. Charge exchange. Fast solar protons can steal electrons from neutral atoms in the comet's outer coma, creating energetic neutral atoms and new ions that change the chemistry we see. If spectrographs catch CO plus and H2O plus lines surging or shifting as the CME passes, that's the physics in motion. Back on Earth, the quake story kept unfolding in a familiar way. Aftershocks decayed from big to small, fast to slow. Agencies mapped stress changes and flagged the chance of more strong aftershocks. Dramatic timing aside, the mechanics were standard plate tectonics. Meanwhile, NOVA watchers focused on what those blasts teach us. How efficiently NOVA accelerate particles, how quickly dust forms and clears, and why some light curves dip and redden after the peak. Even trimmed to essentials, the message stands. These weren't polite brightenings. They were shock-loud eruptions. Circling back to 3i Atlas, there's one last twist. If it truly is interstellar, its coma chemistry could be a little off-book compared to most comets we know. Different ratios of carbon monoxide to water. Unusual trace species. That matters because CME interactions depend on what's available to ionize and how the magnetic field drapes over the coma. A slightly different recipe could mean a different tail response. Sharper kinks, faster disconnections, or a tail that rebuilds on a different timescale. That's why coordinated observations matter. Ground-based images trace the shape. Spectra reveal the chemistry. Spacecraft measure the solar wind and magnetic field, fit them together, and the hit on 3i Atlas becomes a lab experiment we don't get to repeat often. So, where does that leave the, is it a sign, question? Maybe, but not of a hidden force. Maybe it's a sign to study how novae hurl particles, to coordinate observations when space weather rams a comet, and to explain clustering so odds don't morph into fear. Here's the part I can't shake. If nature can deal us a hand like this in three days, what's sitting in the deck for next month? Another bright outburst? A tail that snaps under a solar punch? A quake that doesn't come in pairs, but as a single monster we were ready for because we learned from this week. The record stands either way. Sometimes the rarest patterns play out in plain sight, and when they do, the best move isn't to panic. It's to pay attention. Zooming out, two truths hold. The 72-hour pileup was an outlier, and outliers happen. That tension drives science. Chase the edges, don't overread them. Hold wonder in one hand and data in the other. The stack was loud, the takeaways will be quieter. Better models, better networks, better questions. 
If you want more than a front row seat, track dawn skies for the comet's faint tail, watch solar bulletins when the next CME launches, and check quake catalogs as aftershocks fade. The sky will do its part. We just have to be ready. And that's the twist that keeps me hooked. We didn't catch a hidden puppeteer. We caught a rare moment when stars, storms, and stones shouted at the same time. The echoes are still bouncing. What we do with them is the real story.